And we are so lucky today to have the grandson of former U.S. President Jim Carter. Uh, Jason attended Duke University where he graduated with a double major in philosophy and political science. He then joined the Peace Corps and while stationed in South Africa, um, he was stationed in South Africa and later he attended the University of Georgia where he received his law degree. And I guess the dogs are pretty happy this week. <laughs> um, after graduating from UGA, Jason, well, happy that they beat Georgia Tech, but, you know, whatever. Um, Jason was employed as associate at the law firm of Bondurant, Mixon, and Elmore, and was awarded the Stuart Eisenstadt Young Lawyer Award. In 2010, Jason Carter was elected to represent the 42nd District of Georgia in the State Senate and was re-elected in 2010, uh, re-elected in 2012. Um, he also tried to unseat Governor Nathan Deal, I, I remember that, uh, in last year's election. Uh, very curious about what his future political plans might be, but maybe he'll tell us some of that. Um, we are honored to host Jason as he starts his next chapter as chairman of the Board of Trustees for the Carter Center. And we are also delighted to have the new CEO of the Carter Center here. Mary, are you here? So Jason, please come up. I am honored to be here. I appreciate all of y'all uh, coming. I want to acknowledge, uh, as she said, Ambassador Marianne Peters, who is here as the CEO uh, of the Carter Center. Um, I also noticed two other people who are here, as they mentioned, my mom is here, which is, which is nice, but I wasn't nervous before. I'm a little bit nervous now. <laughs> um, but thank you for coming as well. Um, and also, I want to acknowledge um, who I, someone I saw walk in, uh, just uh, not, not accusing you of being late, Brad. I'm just saying I just saw you walk in. Um, but Brad Curry, who sits on the Carter Center Board of Trustees with me and has for many uh, years uh, chaired the finance uh, committee within that Carter Center Board. And many of you know Brad as a great uh, citizen of Atlanta, as a CEO of, of one of our uh, major companies here. So I'm glad that the Carter Center is well represented and that my uh, Langford side of my family is well represented uh, as well. Um, we. Um, I do want to give you um, an update on my grandparents. Since Maria uh, mentioned it, I'll also give you an update on my uh, political future. And, and as I told Greg, I, I would be sure to get this out of the way early. Um, I am considering uh, a run for governor at least as much as Mark Richt is. <laughs> um, my grandparents um, are doing quite well. Uh, and I wanted to, to, to let y'all know that I, I don't know that I've ever had an experience like I've had since August uh, in terms of being stopped on the street uh, in Atlanta, stopped in my office building, stopped in the Home Depot by my house, stopped in Target, um, stopped at Kroger. I'm telling you everywhere I go these days. But and with people saying, hey, tell your grandfather I'm praying for him. Um, and they are... Uh, they're doing well. He feels good physically. Um, his medical uh, reports have been good. Uh, and they are both in this remarkable place, um, as evidenced, I think, by that uh, press conference that Maria called historic. They are in a, a remarkable place, spiritually uh, and emotionally. And their peace uh, with where they are in, in their lives and where they've been in this world has really allowed them, I think, to, to take in uh, this outpouring of support that has just been incredible. And it has come from all aspects of the, the political spectrum. It's come from all corners of the world. Um, and it has been a, a remarkably, I think, gratifying experience uh, for them. And it takes uh, an incredible human being or two uh, to have a diagnosis like this be almost a happy time for them. Um, and so it, it is incredible. And I'll, I'll just say, you know, last, that the outpouring of support um, has been real in, in, in a host of ways, but last night I went um, out to, to Twin Rivers Middle School in Gwinnett County and gave a very short little speech at an event um, that was a joint chorus concert between uh, Twin Rivers and Dyer Elementary School's choruses where they dedicated their holiday concert to Jimmy Carter. And they sang, all, you know, they sang Amazing Grace, they sang Bob Dylan songs, they sang a Liberian Christmas song. I mean, it was a really incredible thing, but just just to think about that level of, you know, I, I keep saying outpouring, I don't have a better word for it, but that level of support and affection and love that has, that has approached them, it is, it, is, it is very real and it has been um, 
very, I, I think, gratifying for them. And um, I will use that to transition into what I was going to talk about, which is the Carter Center. And at that, uh, the first thing I will say is at that historic press conference, he talked about how this diagnosis was going, he was going to substantially cut back on his schedule. Um, and as Phil Wise and Marianne and Deanna, everyone from the Carter Center can tell you, there's been no evidence of that at all. <laughs> uh, absolutely none. Uh, and my, my new role, um, uh, that, that sort of dynamism, I think, of my grandfathers and my grandmothers that has led them to be as, as energetic and as fully living as any people I've ever met in my life or heard of, frankly, uh, I think Im has imbued the Carter Center with that spirit of, 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 of dynamism. And I'm excited uh, to talk about um, where it's heading. Uh, the first thing I, I want to let you know is what I'm not doing at the Carter Center. Um, and that is, I'm not running anything day to day, which should make everyone happy. Um, <laughs> Ambassador Peters has been the CEO of the Carter Center since last September uh, and, and has done an incredible job. And we always talk about who has big shoes to fill. She has giant shoes to fill. Uh, John Hardman, who is known to many of you, served in that role for more than 20 years um, and has been uh, an important part of this community. And, and Ambassador Peters, over the last year or so, um, has tackled this job with remarkable uh, ability and excitement and uh, courage and care and, and we all are very happy with, with where things are going and, and, uh, and excited about, about the future and her role in this uh, sort of ongoing transition. In addition, I, as Maria mentioned, have big shoes to fill because I'm taking over for Oz Nelson uh, as the chair of the Carter Center a Board of Trustees. And Oz, who many of you remember from his time as the CEO of UPS, um, has been a great citizen of this community uh, and of the world. He served on the Carter Center board for two decades and was the chair since 2009. And so in that process of, of building the board and, and moving it uh, forward, I, I look uh, forward to, to, to my role there. So what, what I'll do is, is be the chair of the board. Um, and that board, like many other organizations, uh, runs the organization and, and, and gives it strategic guidance as best it can. Of course, the two most important members of that board remain my grandparents. Um, but one of the interesting things about the Carter Center and what I want to talk about today is the way that you know, it, its past uh, really, I think, says a lot about where it's headed. Um, they have been actively engaged there since they founded it in 1992. It is their living legacy. Uh, it has been their home and their headquarters for all of the issues that they cared about most. Um, peace, justice, human rights, mental health, uh, the alleviation of, of suffering across the world, and especially among the world's poorest people. But as you look at this entity that they built, and over the last several years, I've chaired the, uh, the, the Carter Center Strategic Planning Committee. Uh, we undertook one of the deepest and most intensive reviews of the Carter Center's uh, projects uh, that have ever been done. Um, and it revealed to me some pretty remarkable things about this organization that they created. The, the first I think principle or the, the, I don't know if this is true or not, <clears throat> but my grandfather claims that his favorite quote, and he's used it in his inaugural address and other times, is from his first grade teacher, Miss Julia Coleman. And the quote is, we must adjust to changing times and still hold to unchanging principles. And that really is what the Carter Center has done. It has been a remarkably dynamic organization for the last three decades. Um, it, it, it has changed enormously. If you, if you listen to the, to the stories and the discussions about how the center was founded, uh, my grandparents thought it was going to be like a mini Camp David, where people could come almost like a retreat. Uh, and av after the success of the, of the peace agreement between Israel and Egypt, which my grandfather would be sure to tell you, not a single word of which has been violated uh, you know, over these many years, after the success of that, they envisioned a, a real peacemaking place uh, that would almost be like a mediation center uh, for important international conflicts. Um, and today, that, that's not anything like what it does. <laughs> but the principles that it was founded upon uh, have not changed at all. Um, if you look at those five principles, uh, they are remarkably consistent. And I'll just tell them to you because I think they are incredible. Number one, the center emphasizes action and measurable results. Number two, that means it's not a think tank. It's a do tank, period. The center seeks to break new ground, and it does not duplicate the effective efforts of others, which means we fill gaps. We go places where no one else is willing to go. Number three, we address difficult problems in difficult situations, and therefore we accept that we can fail. 
because if you're not trying to tackle the toughest jobs in the toughest places, uh, you, you can't do the first, the second thing, which is to fill those gaps. Number four, the center is nonpartisan, and it actively seeks out partnerships with, with, with a host of different types of people. That neutrality, uh, that nonpartisanship, as I mentioned, Oz, who's a diehard Republican, has been the chair for the last several years. We take that neutrality very seriously, and we will work with the highest levels of government and the poorest people in each little village in, 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 in rural Chad. Um, and number five, the center believes that people can improve their own lives if they're given the tools to do it. And if you think about what those things can mean, it really forms a framework for how to, to, to approach the world's issues. And today the center uh, operates, or since its inception, it has been in more than 80 countries, and at any given time it's operated in about 40. I think today we have programs in 36, but Ambassador Peters can correct me if, if that's not uh, right. But the point is, is we, we are doing a variety of different things compared to what we did before. And I want to talk about two examples um, before I talk about where I think we're going and then take questions. The first example is election observation. Um, in 1989, uh, the concept of conflict resolution began to take shape as, as a, election observation began to take shape as a way to deal with conflict resolution around the world. And the, the, the greatest one of the other principles that my grandfather believes is that, and we, I think everybody here will agree, politics to some extent is, a, is an art of self-delusion. Everybody thinks they're going to win, right? <laughs> so you go, you go to, say, warring factions in Liberia, and they say, well, why should we have an election? And you say, well, don't you think you're going to win? And the person says, well, of course I'd win. The people love me. And they say, well, let's have the election. <laughs> And it's amazing how many different people you can get to the table to agree to have the election. And the key, of course, then is making sure that everybody stays on board right up until they found out they did not win. But um, <laughs> the, the Carter Center pioneered the process of international observation of elections, beginning in 1989 with the election in Panama, which the Carter Center actually declared fraudulent. Um, and it has been recognized over the course of, of, of the last 30 years um, as a pioneer in this field. And, and in just last year, the Carter Center um, observed its 100th election. And that level of expertise and that credibility in the international uh, arena is, is remarkable. It has also led the charge now of, of, of developing through the United Nations and others international standards for those observations. Um, and, and, and again, let me, let, I'll talk now about this, this, this election I just observed in Myanmar. The Carter Center doesn't just pioneer the idea of election observations, but when we talk about going to the most difficult places, going to the places, that's the, the, that's the next video, don't worry. <laughs> we'll get there, I know that it's exciting. But um, This is, this is um, just pictures from our, our recent trip to Myanmar, and, and one of the things that, that you should know um, is that this country, which was essentially for in, the intents and purposes of the Western world, wiped off the map for the last half century, is an incredible place. It is an ancient civilization, this Shwedagon Pagoda, uh, which is the center, the living center still of Yangon, uh, Myanmar, it, it was built 2,600 years ago when Buddha was still alive. <laughs> and it's this Buddhist temple that, again, has remained the living center of that community until this day. There are not many cities in the world that have that kind of ancient uh, grounding. And, and you know, the, the other aspects of this country are, are, are truly remarkable. But... Um, this, was the, uh, this is also a great example of the Carter Center's work. Um, this was, uh, in addition to being an incredible sort of personal experience, um, the Carter Center observed the election in Myanmar in the following way. Before anybody else, and you may, the, the history of Myanmar recently is as follows. The, the military um, has had control over that country for many, many years. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, who is the chief opposition uh, they, in, in, in Myanmar, they call her she or the lady. I mean, she is a dominant political figure in that community like Nelson Mandela in South Africa. I mean, it's a truly remarkable human being. Um, but, but the lady um, uh, had been uh, under house arrest for many, many years. The military made noises that they were going to um, open up the electoral process. And, and the national uh, the NLD, which is Aung San Suu Kyi's party, boycotted the elections in 2008. Um, uh, excuse me, in 2010. But over the course of, of the next few years, the military made what we considered to be legitimate um, overtures that they wanted to have a real election. And before anybody else was willing to go to Myanmar and talk to the military about their election, the Carter Center went. 
the Carter Center got there in a difficult place at a difficult time when no one else was doing it and began the process of negotiating with the military government about whether and how they would allow international election observers. Uh, they negotiated the Memorandum of Understanding. They participated uh, in, in drafting all of the, the regulations that would govern the, the international observers and the domestic observers. And once the, internet, once the um, military government agreed, the Carter Center had created a giant amount of space for observers to come in and fill. So from the Carter Center's uh, chief uh, uh, head of the, the, the uh, country there was literally credentialed as election observer number one. Um, and over the course of the next several years, the Carter Center got there in 2014, uh, in December, uh, and so operated for more than a year, observing the electoral process in a long-term way, ensuring and reporting on what exactly was going on in Myanmar over the course of that time. And then by election day, uh, because of that space, in my view, that the Carter Center had created, there were thousands of international observers. There were more than 10,000 uh, Myanmar domestic observers. And the amount of transparency for that election was just gigantic, certainly unprecedented in the history of that country. And that reduces the ability of the military government to, 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 of course, steal the election because of so many eyes looking at it. And importantly, it increases the ability of, uh, of outside folks and, and the people within the country to believe in the process. And the ultimate result of this election, with all of this uh, added transparency, is that, number one, Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, NLD party participated. Um, and in addition, there were 90 other political parties that participated. I mean, that would be a remarkable field day for the, uh, for the media here, I can imagine. <laughs> but it, it, it was an incredible experience. And of course, the military, it was, it was certainly far from a perfect democratic election. Um, the military still maintained control over 25 seats of the parliament. So they only allowed elections for 75% of the parliament. They were going to control three of the most important ministries. Uh, and Aung San Suu Kyi herself is barred by, the, by a constitutional provision from actually getting elected president. But imagine this. Given those restrictions, given the, the, the history in that country of a series of elections that were stolen by the military, given the fact that really nobody had any reason necessarily <coughs> to believe that this was going to be uh, the transition that they all wanted for, that they were all looking for, you still saw the magic of elections. And I, I, I was just realizing that next month will be 20 years since I observed my first election. Um, but they are magical things. And we lose track of that in this country eh, for a host of reasons, and maybe we just take them for granted. But, but they are truly magical. And you look at these pictures, and you look at the folks that stood in line knowing that their candidate wasn't going to be able to win herself, that they were only electing 75% of the parliament, that the military was going to control certain things, that other elections had been stolen, and they lined up at 3 o'clock in the morning to go vote because of that hope and that promise of democracy. And one of the people I talked to just happened to speak English, and, he, and I asked him, you know, how, how long have you been here? He said, I got here at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I said, wow, that sounds like a long time to wait. And he said, oh, but I've been waiting so much longer. And it is an incredible thing. It is an incredible thing uh, to, to go through that, that, that process. And as we said, it was not a, 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 a fully democratic process, but it was one that the Carter Center was able to impact, was able to ensure its transparency, was able to participate in, and we will continue uh, to monitor it. The, the credibility that we built in Myanmar uh, was real. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we, we created a giant amount of space. But as I also mentioned, you're still looking at a situation that's very difficult. Um, the, the issues that are there, the disenfranchisement of the Rohingya, which is the Muslim population that, uh, that lives near the Bangladesh border uh, in Myanmar, uh, is a real serious anti-democratic issue. There are other issues that are confronting Myanmar from a conflict resolution standpoint and otherwise. Um, but again, in the balance, uh, it was a remarkable transition. And as I said before, just a great personal experience for me. Um, in addition to that type of work, which again was not envisioned when it was founded, uh, the Carter Center's peace programs also operate uh, with respect to uh, a huge number of other human rights issues, including access to information, uh, including effect establishing effective justice systems, supporting the rule of law, recognizing the what rights of women and minorities and other groups that have been disenfranchised. Uh, and, and we're doing that in a host of targeted nations across the country and in a variety of different programs, some of which are, are repeatedly changing. Again, that dynamic nature of the center's work is remarkable. The, the, perhaps later, if, if the, the press is interested, Marianne can talk about 
the um, Access to Information Program, which began as a small pilot project and grew into something that became a, a very important part of the Carter Center's Peace Program. Um, in addition to the peace programs of the Carter Center, the, the other uh, remarkable event in the history of the Carter Center is that another gap uh, that, that they saw uh, when, when my grandparents were approached by some folks from the CDC, Bill Fage and Don Hopkins, and said, you know, uh, your influence could make a huge impact in terms of neglected tropical diseases. And they still call them neglected tropical diseases today, but they're not nearly as neglected as they were before the Carter Center started its work. And I want to show a brief video about some of the health programs that are there as more evidence of sort of the dynamic past uh, of the Carter Center and, and, and how it's been operating. For thousands of years, the guinea worm parasite has caused disabling misery. Its victims infected by drinking water contaminated with guinea worm larvae. After a year, the adult worm, up to three feet long, emerges from the body through agonizing skin blisters that incapacitate and cripple. There is no cure for this, and the only treatment is wrapping the worm around a stick and pulling it out inch by inch, every day, for weeks. But now, the end of guinea worm disease is within reach, the result of a more than two-decade eradication campaign led by former U.S. President Jimmy Carter and the Carter Center, based in Atlanta. In 1986, there were an estimated three and a half million cases of guinea worm in Africa and Asia. That number has now been reduced by more than 99%. The only way to stop guinea worm disease is to break its life cycle for at least one year. Across wide areas in Africa, that's the goal of field workers from the Carter Center, working with a coalition of governments and international agencies. And obviously, when you don't have guinea worms, uh, then the children can go to school, the farmers can plant their crops and the anti-economic status of a village and a community, and a nation can be helped. Their strategy includes public education to prevent contamination, supplying millions of water filters, applying safe chemical treatment to water sources, and providing safe water from underground wells. We hope and expect that within a year or two there will be no more guinea worms anywhere. If they succeed, Within the next few years, guinea worm could become the second human disease in history after smallpox to be eradicated from the earth. And I hope we waited long enough after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but the remarkable, the remarkable aspect of this, as they said, it's been reduced by, by a, a huge percentage. Um, last year, there were 126 cases in the world. 20-something uh, years ago, there were 3.5 million. Yeah, I think you can talk. <laughs> we don't have the final numbers for this year, but we think it'll be something like 50. And when you talk to the folks at the Carter Center in the health program, you talk to Ernesto Ruiz, you talk to Don Hopkins, you talk to the other people who are just remarkable uh, in this endeavor, they can tell you what village in Chad it's in. They can tell you, oh yes, uh, that one in southern Sudan was a nine-year-old girl and they found it before it could contaminate other water and the reason she got it is because she's been in this other village. Uh, she spent last year in a different village. The, the level of understanding and the level of expertise is just incredible. And the other thing that's really remarkable about this eradication program, smallpox had a vaccine. There's no cure for guinea worm disease. The only way you stop it, the only way you eradicate it is you go village by village, person by person, and do, again, what the Carter Center is based on. Teach people how to change their own lives. And what they can do and what they have to do, it's a grassroots organization. It's, it's to go out and say, if we do this, we won't have guinea worm disease anymore. And that, again, is, is, is what they've done. And, and that, that process, uh, is, is just incredible. And in August, one of the things my grandfather said at his press conference was that he wanted to outlive guinea worm disease. Um, and at this rate, given where they're both going, uh, he will. And that's just a remarkable, a remarkable thing. And, and the other aspect about that project 
is that it is, there's a network of people who have, we talk about empowerment all the time. These are people in every single village in, in southern Sudan who have done something in their community that they can point to and say, we do not have guinea worm disease in my town anymore, and I'm going to be part of the group of people who eradicated it from the face of the planet. And every one of those people, most of them are volunteers, in every single one of those little villages, and they had it in Nigeria, they had it in Ethiopia, they had it in all of these other places, they've all done something. And you know what? They can do other things. And that network of people can be taken and applied to other diseases, and they're doing that. We're doing that now in certain places. We're, doing, we're taking these models, and, and frankly, the human beings themselves, and we're able to apply uh, new, new, new programs for, for trachoma, for example, uh, and for a, a variety of other diseases that are out there that, that are really remarkable. And that, that aspect of, of the Carter Center's work that, that uses uh, its track record of success that uses its, its network and the, the sort of the assets that it has built up over time to do new things is part of that dynamic nature of what we do. And those principles that I mentioned at the beginning, we fill gaps. If it's being done by somebody else, we will move on. Uh, and, and that working ourselves out of a job, we're about to do that with guinea worm disease. Uh, and what we do next, what we tackle next, will be based on that same set uh, of principles. And I, it's just an exciting time. And, and, and even examples like uh, the, the mental health programs that, that my grandmother has, has done and means so much to her. We've done great work in the United States. But in a place like Liberia, in post-conflict Liberia, there was one mental health professional in the whole country. And the Carter Center used the giant amount of credibility that it had built up over time in Liberia, being part of the election process, being part of the conflict resolution process, being part of, of the, the access to justice uh, in that country for so long, used that credibility to say, we can also help you with respect to mental health and let us start the process of training mental health professionals in a country just beset by post-traumatic stress disorder, by, by years of conflict, by, by you know, in, in addition, the, the, the Ebola uh, outbreaks and others that have just constantly uh, berated that population. The ability to go uh, and, and talk in new ways about mental health there was a really remarkable one. And again, it's, it's an example of the Carter Center taking what it has done, using the principles that it uses, and, and, and moving to, to do something new in a, in a very dynamic way. And of course, that brings me um, to the future. Um, one of, the, one of the good things about my grandparents uh, being 91 and, and, and late 80s is that the center has sort of been planning for when they become less active for like 20 years, <laughs> right? And we've been having this discussion for a long time. Uh, the Carter Center has a giant endowment. Um, the Carter Center uh, has a very, very good uh, development operation that does not rely on my grandparents. We have a, a huge number of experts that have built up a real track record of success, as I've described, and has a real a set of, of, of expertises uh, that, that are world-renowned and has, has true ability uh, out there. And so what, what we do going forward is we take those principles and we apply them. Uh, and we use the expertise that we have in the short term. I think you know, our, our, our job as a board, and, and again, Brad Curry is here and, and many others, uh, is, is to look at those critical gaps that are out there in the world where no one else is working. And, and, to, and if the Carter Center has the ability to make an impact there based upon our, our action and our uh, principles uh, and to generate the measurable results that are part of our principles, uh, We'll, we'll tackle it, knowing, again, that failure is an option for us. Um, and knowing that, that, that what we hope to do is to empower people to change their own lives. And what I believe and what I know uh, is that that model will, will continue. I think in the short term what that means is that we take our areas of expertise uh, that we know, things we know we're good at, and to take them to new places like we did in Myanmar. And the other thing is to look at places like Liberia and others where we know we have giant amounts of credibility and use and apply that credibility to see what other things need to get done. Um, that's, that's the future as I see it, the, the really remarkable legacy uh, of my grandparents at the Carter Center. Uh, is not only that they've accomplished all of these things that, that they've accomplished, 101 election observations, virtually no more guinea worm disease, elimination of, of uh, river blindness in, in most of the United, in, in the Americas soon. Uh, it, is, it is that they've created this organization that's gonna be able to keep doing that. 
and that's going to be able to continue that dynamic way of approaching problems. And that model uh, is one that, that makes it very easy, uh, frankly, um, and very exciting uh, for us as a board and for me as, as the new chair uh, to approach these problems. So I'm excited about that, and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions that you have about the Carter Center or, or otherwise. Um, but thank you very, very much. And thank you very much.